We went out, and the good news is, well, first of all, we had a very, very early breakfast because we needed to have a very early breakfast. She gets, she's just feeling really ill. And I'm like, this sucks. And then she's, she, like, puffs up. She's like, no, I'm going to go out. I was like, honey, like, just a few minutes ago, you were barely able to stand. If you remember, I played it as a new release on PS4. And this was many, many years ago. And I actually played it as a co-op playthrough with a couple of people to try to make it palatable. I guess some games, they do redeem themselves over time. I mean, we've seen it with games like Rainbow Six Siege, Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> Yesterday was my day off. And, of course, people always want to know what happened on your day off. Well, a couple things to talk about. First of all, yesterday was going to be a very busy day because it was the day when my wife and I was going out to do all of these different, uh, uh, different appointments and things that we had all lined up for one day, right? When we have these days where we have to do all this shit, we're like, okay, we're going out and, you know, got to focus on what we're doing and get a bunch of stuff done while we can do it. And to this day, I'm still confused as to why this has to be the case for DSP. I mean, one of the many luxuries of being your own boss and running your own business is that you are solely responsible for your entire schedule, which means that if you want to do things at a time that's more convenient to you, you absolutely can make that happen and just adjust your work around it. It's one of the reasons why I find these Phil's Day Off segments so obnoxious is because very frequently he says that he's crammed a bunch of appointments and things that he has to attend to during his day off, meaning that he doesn't get an actual day off. As someone who tries to utilize their own time to the best of their ability, ESP's irresponsibility with his own time management does really get under my skin and irritates the shit out of me. So we went out and the good news is, well, first of all, we had a very, very early breakfast because we needed to have a very early breakfast <clears throat> because uh, we had so much stuff to do in the afternoon appointment wise. We were jumping from, from place to place to place. So early breakfast, get ready, head out. Go do all of our appointments, which took a, a couple hours, I would say, a few hours. And then we came back and we went to the uh, a grocery store, all right, to go our, do our usual grocery shopping. And then we come home and unpack in the bags. All of a sudden, my wife. I knew as soon as we started this story off by talking about having an early breakfast that we were going to be in for a very interesting day off segment. But what I didn't know and absolutely didn't expect is how quickly I was going to start to have a lot of questions. Questions concerning how he can justify saying that his entire day was full of appointments and things that had to be done, but then went on to say that it only took a couple or even a few hours. A couple or a few means two or three to me, and two or three hours most definitely isn't a large portion of the day. In fact, I would be willing to go as far as to say that if you get all of your household errands and chores done in the span of about two or three hours, you had a very efficient day. My other question and one that I think is far more important is how early did DSP actually wind up making this super early breakfast that he was talking about since he's the one that mentioned it. The chores and errands take two to three hours and you were only gone that long. It doesn't sound like your breakfast was very early at all. It actually sounds like it was more of a brunch. It's all semantics obviously but if you're gonna open your mouth and give information that nobody needed you might want to make sure that it actually corroborates with the story that you're telling because as it stands right now I'm just confused and left questioning whether anything that you're actually saying is accurate all of a sudden my wife is feeling sick and i'm like this sucks because we got all the shit done that like is the busy work shit you know the stuff that is the more tedious stuff and we were just about to head out and do the more fun stuff let's go look around for stuff you know let's look for you know my, my wife needs some new shoes so we're gonna look we're gonna do some shoe shopping together um you know look at go to a pet store look at some cute animals and stuff together you know the fun stuff is that the fun stuff, DSP, going around and looking for things to spend money on? I mean, I understand that he is a full-time consumer and just loves dropping every dime that he has on something that he doesn't need. But it's weird for someone who loves to cry poor on the internet to get more pity bucks to be bragging about how he's just going around and looking at things to purchase. And didn't we just have a story about Kat having to buy shoes off of Amazon not that long ago? To jog your memory, that was the one that she bought the pair of shoes four or five times and they kept returning them because they just refused to fit. It? Are you meaning to tell me that Kat needs yet another pair of shoes? How many pairs of shoes does this lady need? And how could even a full-time farrier keep up with the demand? 
I've also always found it very strange that they frequently talk about going to the pet store and just taking a look at the animals that are there. As a pet owner myself, I don't actually have any interest in going to any pet stores and taking a look at any of the animals that are there. I have my own pets to take care of at home. It's especially weird given how adamant the DSP is that he will never get a second cat because Jasper is a one cat per household style. That it's completely outside of the realm of possibility and that they're just not interested in it. So why are we always looking at additional pets? Are we just looking for more animals that we won't get the blood work done for? She She's just feeling really ill. And I'm like, this sucks. And then she's, she like toughs up. She's like, no, I'm going to go out. I was like, honey, like just a few minutes ago, you were barely able to stand. Like you were going to pass out. You said you felt so, so faint headed and sick. I was like, we can't go out now. So, <clears throat> so basically she stayed home, which sucked because we didn't want to, but she stayed home and I had to go out and finish the second half of the day, which included doing an entire run at Costco uh, by myself. And this was a big one. This was like a giant restocking of the house. We were literally out of every possible thing that you would stock up at at Costco, you know? So I had to go and buy all the cleaning supplies and materials, paper products, uh, 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 clothes, a laundry detergent, you know, every possible thing that you buy in bulk, you save a lot of money at Costco. So I had to do all that myself. And then after that, I had to run to like, like the pet store and a few other things. I got everything done. Throughout my life, I've come to the understanding that my immune system is a bit better than what I find to be typical in everybody else. This is not me in any way trying to brag. I just understand that typically people get sick and I don't. But despite my ignorance when it comes to feeling ill, I also don't think that it's typical for somebody who was just feeling right as rain to be feeling so ill that they think that they're actually going to pass out from being lightheaded. And I love how in this moment, DSP's main concern appears to be the fact that he has to go on an entire Costco run by himself. And it was a big one you guys he had to get um paper plates and laundry detergent i'm completely baffled as to how he can constantly have to do all of these grocery style runs when it seems like he goes every single week and they do nothing but order doordash so what exactly are they buying dsp has also told us in the past that very frequently he often does these errand runs by himself on his day off leaving cat to stay home and enjoy the day relaxing and playing skyrim as she does so at exactly what point was this story interesting and worthy of telling so far DSP there's just been a lot of information that was unnecessary or exactly the same week after week so I'm rushing home because now here's the thing we ate so early that we thought we were going to be out we'll get an early dinner or whatever together but now cats at home right and I'm out doing all the errands and shit trying to, to finish <clears throat> and I'm trying to rush and hurry home so we can order order some food because we have to at this point because you know she's sick you want to run that one back by me one more time? And I'm trying to rush and hurry home so we can order, order some food because we have to at this point because, you know, she's sick. You know, I thought that that's what he said, but I just had to hear it again to make sure. So, of course, now that Cat's sick, we have to order DoorDash because obviously there's no other options. You couldn't have, oh, I don't know, made dinner with some of the food that you just purchased from the store? Of course we couldn't do that because that would actually require DSP to do some of the cooking, which apparently he's just incapable of doing even when his wife is sick. I'm honestly just surprised that he didn't completely disregard the fact that she was sick when it came to dinner time and wake her up to cook dinner anyway. Because I remember a panda style individual that found themselves in that exact circumstance. So let's, let's get home. So we I get home. So what do you want to do? And we had two options. Thai food or Mediterranean food, because neither of those had we eaten in a while. OK, and I apologize for interrupting so soon, but never once in the rare occasion that I do actually get sick. Have I ever thought to myself during, you know what? I could really go for some Mediterranean food or some Thai food, actually. If she's as sick as he is saying so sick, in fact, that she couldn't possibly have finished out the errands for the day and do what they call, quote unquote, the fun stuff. I couldn't imagine that Mediterranean food or Thai food is particularly high on her list of things that she would like to eat currently. Not that there's anything wrong with either of those food choices, but just not while you're sick, you know? And so we're looking at it and we're like, well, you know, we haven't had the Thai food in many months. And the last thing time that we ordered from this Thai place, it was really, really good. We got this cashew chicken noodles, um, which is super tasty. It's like sweet, but has a little bit of savoriness to it. You know, I love cashews. And last time we got it, it was like absolutely really good. But, you know, the, uh, Thai food, they have spice levels. And we had ordered a one and a two last time. And both of us tried each other's and we're like, man, it's kind of mild. So maybe next time we'll even kick it up a notch. So this time I'm like, what should we get? We're like, well, my wife's not feeling that great. So why don't we just get two, which we did last time, which we felt was mild, right? And and then we, and you know, there we go. So 
We order the food. The good news is the food arrives right away, and I'm starving. I'm super hungry because we had eaten breakfast early. You're right. Thank God that the food showed up almost immediately because we couldn't possibly eat some of the snacks that I know you bought at this store and just brought home. There's just nothing about this story that actually makes any sort of sense to me. It's like every time he says one sentence, I'm left walking away with two questions. So I'm so hungry. And <clears throat> we open it up and we start to eat it. And immediately we're like, ah, what the fuck? We start drinking. What the hell? Dude, my eyes start watering, my nose starts running, and my, my blood pressure goes up. I'm sweating. I was like, what the fuck? And we're trying to eat it. It is the spiciest fucking Asian food I've ever eaten in my life. There is no way that that was spice level two. That had to be like maximum spice or maybe like one step below maximum spice. We were like, that is the hottest fucking food. And the thing is, you eat it, you, know, you can taste the flavors. The flavors are good, but then it's just so burning on your tongue, you can't fucking eat it. Uh, oh my God, what the... They fucked it up. There was no way that Spice Level 2, we had ordered from them before and done Spice Level 2, and it wasn't that hot. So, you know, basically, we're like, what are we going to do? What do you mean, what are you going to do? You're either going to continue to eat it despite how spicy it is, or you're going to throw the food away and make something else. How is there any discussion to be had? These are two separate choices for two separate individuals. Are you personally going to continue to eat your food or not? But I swear that DSP has more issues with these delivery services than anybody else. I don't know if it's because statistically using the service more often, he's bound to have more negative experiences than the average person, but it seems like it's happening all of the time. How often does he actually get on stream and tell everybody, yeah, yeah, guys, the DoorDash delivery was fantastic and my driver totally didn't have a foreign accent. I can't recall a single time. I said, well, we got to get more food, but we can't eat this. So I contacted the app. I explained the situation. They forced me to take a picture and they gave me credit. They said, okay, here's your credit back. Order again. So we did. So we actually ordered the Mediterranean food instead. All right. But the thing was, I was so hungry. Because I, I really was so hungry. I was like, I got to eat some of this. If I don't eat this now, I'm going to get like a stomach ache because I'm so hungry. So I start eating the spicy food. That was the worst fucking choice, man. I don't know. I mean, I was so hungry. I couldn't control myself at this point. It, the flavor was good, but the spice was insane. Okay. I always find myself saying that I should never underestimate DSP, that he always can manage to sink lower and lower. And yet, time after time, I find myself being utterly shocked and surprised, and even sometimes appalled at how much further he sinks. So not only did we order the DoorDash because our wife was sick despite bringing home all of the groceries, after the food was not up to snuff and it was far too spicy to actually eat, they got a refund for the DoorDash and then continued to order a completely different set of food. But because it was going to take more more time for the food to arrive instead of again just eating the food that he's brought home from the grocery store for the household he decided to continue to eat the food that was far too spicy so much so that they got a refund for it again just nothing in this story adding up not a single logical step was taken by anybody involved in the story at all so basically i eat this and then it was a really bad choice <laughs> it was a very very bad choice because number one, my stomach felt awful for the rest of the night. That was number one. And then number two, as you know, when you eat ultra spicy food, and then when you go to, well, when, you know, your body's done with it, uh, you could get a second helping of pain. And man, I had a second and third helping of pain that night. I was really not doing well. Even though I was, I was in bed ready to go to sleep, and I had to run to the bathroom again before I went to sleep. And of course, to cap off this glorious tale that absolutely everybody needed to hear, DSP decided to bring in the scatological style humor. But honestly, it just serves him right for going as far as to get a refund on food that he didn't like, but continue to eat it anyway, because he couldn't be bothered to actually eat the food in his house. Now, now outside, outside of the, the food, food debacle, debacle, I think that this is one of the more interesting Phil's day offs that I've ever seen. Because in the second half, DSP actually acknowledges that he was wrong for once. Shocking, I know. And wait till you find out that it's about his opinion on Destiny 2. You know, that game that he's absolutely ranted and raved about in the past? In 2023, can anyone <clears throat> with a straight face, a right mind, and in any kind of honest way, lift their right hand and say, Destiny 2 is definitely culturally relevant to gaming today?
if you can believe it, <clears throat> just listen to this. Cat has been looking um for a uh a, a game to play. And right now she says the next game that she's looking at that's making her look like she's interested in it is possibly Star Wars Outlaws. Like that's the one she's eyeballing as the next game she personally wants to play. Outside of that, there's like nothing going on. And so she has been looking for something to play that's free rather than drop a lot of money because she's already bought a couple games this year that burned her. Like the last one was Dragon's Dogma 2. And she's really upset about that because she bought it. And she played it way more than me. She played Dragon's Dogma 2 like 30, 40 hours. She got so bored she couldn't play it anymore. She's like, this game is fucking atrociously boring. There was a bunch of bugs for her. Like she got into situations where there were NPCs were supposed to be somewhere for a quest and they just weren't in the game. Inexplicably, they just weren't in the game at all. Like, what? So she quit the game. And she's like, she just doesn't want to buy any games right now. She's not convinced that buying any games are going to be in her interest, but she has Game Pass. So she's been looking for a new Game Pass game to play. Um, <clears throat> she stopped playing Mass Effect Andromeda. She got a certain distance in the game, and then she got fucking bored of it and didn't want to play it anymore. You know, for somebody who loves to talk about how they love to keep their work life and personal life separate, DSP does seem to bring up Cat quite a bit when nobody asks. I understand that this is the day off segment, which again is kind of weird when you like to keep those things separate, but I digress. They could have just not mentioned this at all, but now that he has, we get to talk about it. How robust is that? And to keep with the theme of today's episode, I'm just left wondering how many games is Cat actually going to finish this year? Because it sounds like she's completing games at a faster rate than DSP is, or at least playing more more games than DSP is. It seems like every week DSP is telling us that she's trying out some other game because she beat the last one or just wasn't satisfied with it. And it's really no wonder if she's actually completing that many video games or at least playing that many video games that nothing in the house is taken care of the way that it should be. It seems like neither of these people are capable of managing their time in a responsible way. You know, the way that two grown adults are supposed to behave. It just seems to me like the snort fort is turning into a house of sin. Well, all of the sins except for lust, obviously. So of all things, the game she has chosen to try certainly, certainly didn't, uh, my God, certainly didn't expect this in any way, shape, or form. All right, you ready? She's playing Destiny 2. All right? Now, however, I should, I should emphasize something. Destiny 2 2024. From what I can see, is a dramatically different game from Destiny 2 when I played it as a new release. I don't think that you had to clarify that. I'm pretty sure that anybody who cared about video games or at least Destiny 2 is well aware of the fact that the game is not exactly how it launched. Obviously, it's a live service game and it's going to have many different iterations throughout its lifespan. What I am actually surprised to hear is that DSP is singing its praises, saying that it's a better game now than it was then. Because if you listen to DSP the last time that he was bringing up Destiny 2, he didn't have anything positive to say. And that was in 2023, the end of 2023, in fact. Here's a clip of that. If you remember, I played it as a new release on PS4, and this was many, many years ago, and I actually played it as a co-op playthrough with a couple of people to try to make it palatable, because I played Destiny 1 solo, and I thought it sucked. I thought it was such a boring grind. I didn't understand why people liked it so much. So I actually played Destiny 2 co-op to see if it would be better. Looks like this is in the wrong position. Ha <laughs> look at that. Uh, and the answer is... Is, is Destiny 2 better co-op than solo? No, it wasn't. Like, Destiny 2, I felt like the story was boring and terrible. I felt like the gameplay was just the same gameplay loop, boring over and over. There wasn't enough original stuff in the game. The loot was kind of just arbitrarily there. It didn't really improve the game or anything. Um, Like I said, as I said with Destiny 1, it's literally Halo combined with Borderlands. And that's, there's nothing to it. It's just, there's no substance there. It's all just repetitive grind, right? So for people who like repetitive grind with friends, there you go. It's great. But for those who are looking for like a solid gaming experience with a good story and everything, it didn't have it, all right? But that was at launch. So she started playing Destiny 2. First of all, she's playing it on the Xbox Series S. This game looks ridiculously good on the Xbox Series S. This might be the best performing game on the console. It runs an incredibly solid 60 frames per second at 1080p. The graphics are very detailed. The effects are amazing. 
like when she's playing this game, I was like, dude, it looks like Doom or, you know, it looks like a, a high end FPS on the Series S. I was very impressed with how it performed on there. Like, damn, that's like actually really, really good. Well, it's a AAA studio high-end FPS DSP. I sure hope it looks like that. I don't think that Destiny ever failed in the visuals department. In fact, I've always thought Destiny looked fairly decent for what it was. But of course, this is DSP Space Gaming, where the only kind things that we actually have to say about video games is that they look good, as if that actually mattered to the gameplay at all. But I love how immediately after talking about the downsides of the original Destiny 2, the looting and shooting mechanics not being refined and the story being abysmal, the very first thing that he has to say as a positive for the new and improved version is that the game looks good, something that he didn't even knock the game for previously. The guy's never exactly been an exquisite storyteller by any means, hell half the time he can't even tell a cohesive story to save his life, but you would think that you would be able to string a couple of sentences together that actually make some sort of sense when put together. But as always, this story is all over the place and the points that we're bringing up are similarly all over the place. Okay, now she starts playing it and immediately there's all these story elements in it. Like there's a story opening. Here's five stories you could play right now. And so she just picked one. I think she might have picked the most recent one. I'm not sure because I don't know. I've played this game since it launched. So she picked one of the stories to play. And she starts playing it. There's all these cool story elements, cool cutscenes, new enemy types. She's immediately finding new weapons and things. And I'm like, what is this like? This is like good. Like I was watching her play, I'm like, this is this is pretty good actually. Like this is interesting to me. And she played through this giant uh part of the game, um, where there was like this special new boss and stuff. She got to a new planet, and there was a new race of people that she's meeting now and doing stuff with. And I was like, wow, this is like a game. Like unlike Destiny Two when I played it, which was choppy, repetitive, boring, and the story was atrociously bad. This is like interesting. Like they put effort into this. I would imagine that they were always putting effort into Destiny 2. It just didn't make for a good game, at least not in my opinion. And I think that if DSP watched her play for long enough and actually was invested in the gameplay itself, that he would find out very quickly that pretty much all of the complaints that he had are probably still accurate to him. It's going to be the same gameplay loop over and over again, getting repetitive, something that he very clearly takes issue with. And it doesn't really matter how many different DLCs and expansions they put into the game. I never thought that the Destiny storylines were ever all that riveting. In fact, they've never piqued my interest enough to actually look into the lore of the world. And that's really saying something as somebody who really enjoys the lore of these universes. Knowing that under the surface, the gameplay loop is still the same and the story is never going to be interesting, I'm honestly just left wondering how much of this positive impression of Destiny 2 was left on DSP because it was Cat playing the game. How much does Cat's opinion on a video game affect DSP's opinion and I guess in turn affect the dense opinion on a game? And it's funny because a lot of people had told me, yeah, over the years, one, basically Destiny 2 has changed. When they left from being under the thumb of, uh, who was it that owned them? I forget who actually owned Bungie at one point. Was it Activision Blizzard? I can't remember who owned them. But whenever they, whoever they were owned by, supposedly their complaint was they could never really do what they wanted to do because they were always being told what to do. Because they were owned, so they had to do what they were told. You know, do, hide it behind this paywall, do this microtransaction. No, you can't give them this content because of this, this, this. Do this instead, right? It was Activision? Okay. So, basically, yeah. And, and, and so because of that, supposedly, the game wasn't as good. And apparently, after they got out of that, that controlling atmosphere, they improved Destiny 2 a lot, and the game ended up being way better. But what I can see is that the game is way better. It's just insane to me how given the exact same information that he was given months ago, his opinion has completely 180. Because during his last Destiny 2 rant, the one that I covered, I believe it was in November, he also acknowledged the split from Bungie and Activision. And in that very rant, he scolded Bungie for wanting to be bought out by Sony and not improving their game the entire time that they were no longer under the thumb of Activision. But now he's reciting this tale for a second time and he seems less sure of it now than he did months ago. And he's completely fallen 
villain for the story. He 100% believes that Activision was the one that was making Destiny 2 a terrible game and that after they left Activision, the game just infinitely got better. I'm not actually here to weigh in on whether or not Destiny 2 got any better after Activision left, I don't really recall. What I can say though is DSP's opinion on the game has completely flipped from night to day without any additional information. You could argue that there was new information, he saw the game firsthand, but he was always capable of doing that. It's literally a free to play game and people were asking him to do it. Like, now, now listen, it's still a first person shooter. It still plays like Halo, all right? There are different improvements now, different weapons and classes and things you can do. But from what I'm seeing, the story is much better. Like, the, actually, the story is interesting. You're doing these things, nice cutscenes, good, good narrative elements, you know. There's still an element, like, if you try to play some of the core game stuff, it's still kind of weird. Like, it feels like very disconnected, disjointed MMO shit. Go to this planet and kill a bunch of random enemies. Trade in the items you got off the enemies to some random NPC, and he gives you a bunch of loot. Then leave that planet and go somewhere else. Do a little bit of, like, platforming fight a boss, then go back to another planet, talk to the leader, then go to this planet and fight a bunch of enemies, like, like captains or something. It's like, what? Like, what are you, what is this? It's like not even connected. Like, why are we doing this? It's very weird in that regard, right? But all the, uh, the DLCs and things, I guess for the game, have, have free elements. Like you have to buy the DLC to get the full content, but if you don't buy it, there's still free stuff. Like the free story is in there. So Kat hasn't spent a dollar on this game right and she's actually starting to play and she's like i really like this is good she's getting hooked on it and i was like i don't blame you i'm looking at it and i'm i'm actually impressed with how good the game looks plays and that the story elements are actually pretty interesting I really don't know how different the game can actually be from the last time that DSP saw it to make him think that it's just exponentially better and actually worth his time. It's still going to be a first person looter shooter style. He says that it plays like Halo, which to me just says that he has no idea how a Halo game even plays anymore. And he just acknowledged the fact that the mission structure is still very MMO like, meaning that it's not very cohesive and very disjointed. So I find it really difficult to believe that he's actually following any sort of narrative that's going on, which again, just leaves me wondering aside from the upgraded visuals from running on newer hardware what exactly about the game is different that dsp is seeing because all of the issues that he originally had with destiny 2 when he played it are still prevalent in the game the only difference is kind of the story because they actually got rid of the original one but the new one isn't all that interesting either so here's an example of a game where it started bland and boring and felt unfinished and choppy and just play for the sake of playing with your buddies. And it looks like they've actually transformed it into something that you could actually enjoy even if you're playing solo due to all of its improvements. So that's a good thing. By the way, not that you always play solo because there's some missions you have to play with people, but it's fine. Like she played a few missions just with randoms, you know, teaming up randomly and playing and it seemed to work fine. The online connectivity seems good, right? DSP confirming that Cat actually has more courage when it comes to playing online than he does. Very cool, very robust. I'm glad we could get the confirmation that he's a huge coward even when it comes to online interactions with random people that won't matter. I've said it once before, I'll say it again. DSP is nothing if not a consumer and a coward. So, I'm impressed, honestly. I'm, I'm legitimately impressed. I didn't realize that destiny 2 had that many improvements and that's the kind of thing that like i would never know because you guys have never asked me to go back to it right after i played it at launch and i did the full playthrough of the campaign you guys literally not once have said hey phil go back to destiny 2 they had a big expansion and it was so hyped up and i remember it was earlier this year they were so hyped that expansions coming and everyone's like well phil aren't you gonna play or talk about it no it's literally not culturally relevant it's only for people who are still playing Destiny 2. It doesn't matter what the games media says. The games media always hype shit up that they're paid to fucking advertise. You understand? There was zero reason for anyone to be excited about a Destiny 2 expansion in 2023. I guess that didn't age well, did it, Philly boy? Every once in a while, people joke about it. Hey, Philly, you're going to play the new DLC? I'm like, what? Of course I'm not going to play the new DLC, right? And what's funny, I think I own it digitally. So if I wanted to, I could play this on PS5. And can you imagine how the game probably runs on PS5? probably gorgeous right you could, i mean i wonder if it runs at a high frame rate like can you do 120 frames or can you at least do 120 hertz you know i wonder <laughs> i'm just curious because I, I haven't done a first person shooter yet since i i improved my setup i'm wondering what the game would look like but by the way no i'm not doing it now this would not be the time for it with all the new stuff coming out next week but 
<laughs> I was just like, wow, the game is good. So I'll, I'll just tell you this, guys. You know, and this is just me being honest. I guess some games, they do redeem themselves over time. I mean, we've seen it with games like Rainbow Six Siege, Final Fantasy XIV. To me, Destiny 2 today looks like a, a complete entertaining product. What a fantastic review from somebody who's probably never going to play the game again. That's whose opinion really matters, obviously. Also, a completely dented take to say that Rainbow Six Siege has only gotten better with time and that they've really improved the game. As a former Siege fan and player, the game has only gotten worse with time, and every time they add new operators, I can't help but roll my eyes at the idea that people are still putting up with that game. It wasn't at launch, but now it looks good. So hey... It's only like, what, seven years in or whatever? I think it is, right? It's like insanely long into its life cycle. Maybe now if you play it, you'll have a good time with me. All right. So anyway, that was pretty much my day off. It was doing stuff with my wife in the morning, getting to the point where we were going to go do fun stuff, but then she got sick. So then I went out by myself to do the rest of the shit. And then we came home and I ate insanely spicy food and ended up in a lot of pain and suffering for the rest of the night. But I got to watch my wife play some Destiny 2. Oh, and we watched some more BattleBots as well. The BattleBots show that we've been telling you about, we love it. We're addicted to it. We're going to keep watching. There's like six seasons on Max. We're probably going to watch them all because <clears throat> we're having a great time with it. Very, Very cool, cool, DSP. Shout out BattleBots, I guess. And speaking of shout outs, shout outs to the 60 Skulls because this is the end of this video, but not before we take a look at some of the comments from the last one. Paul Turner says, Phil has very strong authoritarian inclinations. He is dying for power or for someone in power to put their thumb on the scales and put him back to where he thinks he belongs. And that's exactly what he wants. The entire time that he's been on YouTube, he's always thought that somebody who's in control of things should make it so that he's on top at all times and that everybody else, people that he deems lesser than him, should of course be forced to the bottom. I just hope that one day the self-pignosis breaks and he'll see everything for what it really is. He'll come back to reality and realize that he's a talentless piece of shit that has no business actually making any sort of content. Spartan Possum says at this point DSP can only keep the blood flowing by complaining about something because he obviously has no heart anymore. And I actually think that that's a fairly solid theory or at least the only one that makes sense because he complains way more often than anybody else I know and I'm a toxic style myself. I love complaining. And 713 says, bro hates YouTube so much, you'd think he'd go stream somewhere else. And I've been saying that for years. DSP's been complaining about YouTube the entire time that he's been on the platform, and yet he puts all of his eggs in this one basket, this basket that he can't stand. Obviously, he tried to stream on Twitch for as long as possible, but he was forcibly removed from there, and that's as far as his effort would take him. He couldn't possibly be bothered to look into any of these other platforms. That would just require too much effort, dude. And speaking of effort, I want to thank everybody for watching this video, especially if you made it this far. Hopefully, I'll catch all of you guys in the next video. But until then, make sure that you check out other detractor content and dive deeper into that. Snortex. Yeah.